All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning into this session called Wading into the Economic Impacts of Climate Change on Water. My name is Ahmed Rashid Al Khattabi, and I'll be moderating this session. I'm a postdoc at the US Environmental Protection Agency in the Office of Water, where I uh, work on research projects related to various aspects of water management, including topics related to water conservation and the quanti quantifying of uh, economic benefits related to improvements in water quality. Before turning the mic over to our presenters, I'll briefly motivate why I think the topic we're here to discuss today uh, is of utmost importance with just a thought on the bigger picture that kind of unites the presentations that you'll be hearing this session. Water resources are increasingly scarce uh, and uh, increasingly and in many places already strained due to population growth, increased competition over water resources, land use decisions, and extreme weather events. Changes in climate are exacerbating this strain by either further limiting the amount of uh, available water, decreasing its quality, or both, which can have dire consequences for the provision of drinking water, the agricultural sector, and other aspects of development. These consequences underscore the importance of, one, quantifying the economic impacts associated with climate change, and then two, evaluating approaches that can address these impacts that can still promote economic development. There's still a lot we don't know on these fronts, so I'm excited to hear and learn from the cutting edge research that our speakers will be presenting this session. Um, before we get started and wade uh, into talking about economic impact, um, I'd like to address some housekeeping issues. First, I would like to thank our main sponsor, Edison International, and all of the event collaborators. Um, I would also like to thank the production managers and staff working tirelessly behind the scenes um, this symposium would not have been possible without their hard work. Second, uh, there will be a total of three presentations this session, each of which will last about 20 minutes. There will be a time of a few minutes, about five minutes after each presentation for questions, uh, but then there'll be a dedicated Q&A session at the very end. And this brings me to my final uh, housekeeping issue, which is I'd like to invite and encourage all of you to ask the speakers questions, and you can do so by submitting questions through the Q&A uh, by, by clicking on the question mark button. All right, so I'll go ahead and introduce our uh, overview of the, of, the, of, the, of the session today. During this session, we'll be hearing from three speakers. First, we'll hear from Dr. Valerie Mueller on evaluating the economic impacts associated with increases in the salinity of water resources due to sea level rise using data from Bangladesh. Dr. Mueller is a professor at Arizona State University in the School of Politics and Global Studies. Second, we'll hear from Dr. Will Raffi on the value that water markets can create by reallocating water resources during periods of drought using data from the largest water market history of water market in, in history, which is in Australia. Dr. Raffi is a professor at UCLA in the Department of Economics. And last but not least, we'll hear from Dr. Katrina Gesso on how pricing groundwater can change farmers' water usage and thus address externalities that arise from excessive groundwater irrigation. Dr. Gesso is a professor at UC Davis in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. So that introduction, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Mueller, to go live and take the stage. Thank you. Can you hear me? I hope so. Okay, I just wanna, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I was sick all last night and I hope I, I'm coherent today. Um, but I really appreciate the introduction, and I really appreciate um, uh, the invitation to present my work on sea level rise and the economic repercussions of the salinity front expansion. Actually, the some my my recent work has been focusing on the role of uh, soil salinity and how that uh, drives migration. Um, but it, it was brought to my attention by two oceanographers. Um, Fabian Duran and Raju Sharon, that they made this discovery that there was a massive extension or expansion of the salinity front in Bangladesh. And so what we'd like to do in this paper is sort of look at what happens when you go from an area that was once freshwater to an area that's sort of newly brackish and what are the implications on economic activity. Okay. Um, so when I first started working on sea level rise, I mean, my main question was why has there been little progression and interventions to address this in low and middle income countries? And 
Many of you have sort of read the literature. It's very difficult to measure effects of environmental risks that occur at the tails, if at all. It's very difficult to find events of these instances in data in this part of the world. Um, and there is definitely a lot of uncertainty around how and when sea level rise is going to affect humans. Um, exposure is multifaceted as well. There's been quite a bit of attention on freshwater inundation or flooding in general, um, but there are also just cyclical things that are happening and changing with respect to the, the you know, the, the, the king tides, the extent their storm surge, um, erosion, and also soil and groundwater salinization. And so it's quite, it's quite complicated how to sort of see how these various, various aspects of this exposure affect livelihoods. And it wasn't until Joyce Chen and I started um, working on this issue in Bangladesh where I, I've actually written several papers just looking at migration and flooding. And we sort of, the quality of literature was always pointing out to this displacement that might have been temporary, but we could never detect it on a permanent basis. And so we tried to sort of say, is it the way we're measuring flooding? Is it you know, the type of data that we're using to capture migration. And it just, no matter what we did, we never saw this effect. And so we started uh, understanding the story a little bit more and realizing that it's freshwater flooding is probably not the problem. It's probably um, saline water flooding that is more likely the problem and more likely to displace people in this part of the world. Okay, and so the, the scientists that I've worked with, they published a paper basically on their findings that in 2000, between 2006 and 2007, this red line, which which originally demarcated the uh, salinity front in Bangladesh, so these regions below this red line were traditionally considered part of the salinity front. It it experienced a shift of about 20 kilometers north, and sort of encompassing these these households that used to be part of sort of, they were in freshwater region and now they're sort of classified as newly brackish. And so what we are trying to do is basically see how do the livelihoods of households within this uh, crescent area fare to those that have always been living in the salinity front or the always brackish um, group relative to those that have always been living in freshwater environments. So there's two research questions that we're trying to answer here. First, are there short-term economic losses from the salinity front expansion? And what pra practices might have led to these short-term losses? And this contribution probably has, there's several linkages to different literatures. First, um, there's a policy contribution in that the salinity front expansion of 20 kilometers was is equivalent to what was projected to occur over the coming century. So we can actually measure um, actual benefits to sea level rise rather than um, focus on projections. Um, typically, the economic literature is focusing on impacts of coastal areas, and we're actually looking at the impacts of newly exposed areas. <clears throat> As I said before, most studies are fo focused on flooding, particularly freshwater flooding, and they're not really differentiating the effects of inundation from salinization. And then finally, um, few studies are actually measuring the effects of increased salinization um, on broader economic activity. Um, they have There has been some literature looking at correlations with yields. All right, so to get an understanding of what this means, um, we need to have an understanding of what levels of water salinity are dangerous. And so the 0.6 units on the practical salinity scale, basically, if you have water at that level, you, you cannot drink it. But anything above 2 PSS cannot be used for rice irrigation purposes. And that's precisely what was occurring in those newly brackish areas. Um, there's a paper by Descupta at all that show that um, high yield variety rice output is 15.6% lower in locations with soil salinity greater than 2 PSS. So we at the very least expect that rice, the livelihoods of rice, of rice farmers are going to be affected. All right, now there's several reasons for the shift in the salinity front. One is increase in sea level, but there are also a few other things that are happening um, with respect to the hydrology. It's in result of lower river discharges and also a de decrease in groundwater levels. And that often happens when you have people over irrigating um, rice. Mm -hmm. So this is basically our research design. 
Um, the newly brackish area that's sort of we consider our treatment group is basically the the unions that are in between the unions and the households in the unions that are in between this red and blue line, which mark, demarcate the two salinity fronts, the old one and the and the new one. Um, and then what we did was we wanted to compare these unions and households to those unions and households that are about 10 kilometers south and 10 kilometers north of those areas. And we and we basically, to be conservative, we also drop any of the unions that are sort of intersecting those lines um, because it was just too difficult to determine, um, you know, to what extent one should be included in one region or the other. And we're using several data sources here. Um, we're looking at nightlight intensity um, over from 2000 to 2013. I know there are other more recent data sets for nightlight intensity, but we wouldn't have sort of pre um, pre-salinity front observations. Um, we're also looking at the enhanced vegetation index um, to look at vegetation more broadly. And these are the unit of analysis for these is the union level. And then we also are, are analyzing um, the agricultural census of 2008. And there we're gonna look at a variety of things. Um, that's mostly correlation analysis where we wanna compare sort of what HI, high yield variety practices are like relative to local um, rice practices. Are people shifting away um, towards periods when there's, uh, towards local rice because it, although it's not productive, um, they're less likely to be exposed to water salinity. Um, we also are looking at land fallowed and we also, um, are looking at sort of the tendency to diversify into aquaculture. Um, we have some control variables. We're basically um, taking the CHIRPS max and CHIRPS data set to have controls on rainfall and temperature. And although not shown here, we're also using the GRUMP to make sure that our outcomes are not driven by population displacement. Okay, so we, we estimate different specifications, but the main one is this. We're going to look at these outcomes and include union and uh, year fixed effects. We're gonna focus on um, the treatment is sort of whether the union or the household is in the newly brackish area interacted with whether this is the outcomes occurring after uh, 2007. And then we have our temperature and rainfall controls and we're clustering at the union level. Okay, we also um, we also run a specification or version of this where we pre-process the data using entropy matching. We run the entropy matching procedure to weight the control observations in each of the three designs. We're going to use time invariant pretreatment average of the outcomes that we have that are geo uh, from satellite data. And then what's nice about the entropy balancing um, procedure is that it imposes constraints that the first two moments are balanced. So here are some descriptive statistics of the main outcomes, the EVI and the nightlight intensity. Um, with the types that we're newly brackish is sort of equivalent to our treatment group. And then we have three designs where the control group is the always fresh group, the always brackish group, and then we combine both into one control group. And one thing we can see when we don't do the pre-processing is our standardized difference, depending on which outcome we're looking at, our standardized differences might not be around 20, which is what we would like in absolute value, and our variance ratios might not, might not be um, close to as close to one as we would like. So this was sort of the motivation to provide two types of specifications, one with the unweighted data and one with the weighted data um, after pre-processing. And so here's just a visualization. You can see that in terms of nightlight intensity, for the most part, the outcomes before the salinity front expansion are pretty similar, but afterwards we see declines on the order of 33% on average. Um, irrespective of which control group we're using, we see a loss in nightlight intensity. And here's just the table of results. I We basically uh, transform this uh, nightlight intensity using the inverse hyperbolic sign. Um, so here I'm also reporting the elasticities, so it's easier to see the effect sizes. We also look at EVI impacts, and if uh, column six is basically showing you the specification I th that I showed you in the slide with the um, with the weighted data. Column three is basically showing you that same specification with the unweighted data. And for the most part, we see a potential pos more positive effect in the always brackish area 
but it's not necessarily precise or robust. Um, if, we if we use the design where we're comparing the brackish areas to um, always fresh, we see that there might be even a negative effect, um, but again, these are not precisely measured. So what we do, what we also do in this paper is sort of look, use the agricultural census to see sort of how the practices are changing. And for the most part, we see that uh, production is that on the one hand, uh, people are sort of substituting high yield rice, which is not as productive under uh, high water salinity conditions with the local rice that's uh, produced at a time where uh, the water salinity is lower. We also see that there are some tendencies to diversify into shrimp production. Um, and we're, we also see that there's quite a bit of land that's being taken out of production. And so the combination of these types of practices are, might be explaining why we see this sort of um, small effect on vegetation annually overall. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll just go ahead and ask you a, a very quick question. Um, sure. What's, the, what's an advantage of using the entropy matching versus, I don't know, propensity score matching? The entropy, so one of the clear advantages of entropy is that the moments you can, you can sort of, it optimizes on the moments. So when you're looking at whether these uh, characteristics or outcomes are comparable, um, they, they, it basically, it, it optimizes. So the standardized differences across the groups are zero and the variance ratio is going to be one. You can even optimize on three moments if you'd like. Oh, cool. I still don't see any questions. So, I'll, um, I will okay. uh, go ahead and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I will. Um, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Will Raffi. Great. Um, everyone can hear me and it's all good. All right, I will assume that everyone can hear me. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to talk about some of my research. Uh, this is uh, a broader set of papers which are focused on uh, the fact that climate change is making water resources increasingly scarce and variable as we understand. Uh, this is not just the case for water, but across the board uh, for all uh, natural resources. But uh, the institutions that we have for managing scarce resources, in particular water, were typically designed by hydrologists and engineers, uh, often in a past era. And so what's not well understood uh, is how this potential for water misallocation will interact with climate change. Many have suggested that water markets can be potentially valuable institutions for improving allocative efficiency, uh, but uh, there has been limited evidence to date that has demonstrated uh, that these Water markets can deliver substantial value. And this is in part because, uh, in theory, they may not create uh, any value and could be uh, potentially bad. So, river flow constraints uh, can impede trade, non competitive conduct can give rise to market power, and uh, liquidity constraints, which are common to agricultural settings, can all dampen or even reverse the gains from water trading. So, uh, my paper is. Uh, an approach to uh, value water markets in a way that is sensitive to these evolving hydrological conditions that generate conflicting economic predictions and does not assume that trading is efficient, uh, competitive, or even necessarily uh, creating social value. And so part of this motivation is because these flow constraints on trade mean that you might see a farmer uh, not trade water, and that could be because they have a low valuation for water, or it could be because they couldn't access the market. Uh, to begin with. And so rather than uh, using a revealed preference, as has been uh, typically the case, uh, my approach proceeds in two steps. Uh, first, I estimate irrigated agricultural production functions uh, using uh, new data 
on uh, agriculture in Australia from the Department of Agriculture. And that lets me substitute a theory of production uh, for the traditional revealed preference approach. Second, uh, I use uh, these estimates to value realized market-based water reallocation. Uh, and this is a specific calculation which delivers the realized gains from trade, um, but does not need to assume that trading is efficient uh, or even uh, that I characterize a set of feasible trades that are available to participants. So uh, the value of water uh, is going to depend crucially on uh, the evolving environmental conditions, and this is in part why it's necessary to revisit these institutions in light of ongoing climate change. And the data that I have lets me study how water scarcity varying across the basin and over time uh, affects that value uh, of the market. And uh, in addition, agents will adapt to water market access or autarky using a variety of economic strategies. And this is counterfactual behavior I don't observe. And so I estimate models of factor demand in order to characterize these decisions. So uh, more specifically, the setting of the paper and its empirical analysis is the most advanced water market in the world. This is in Australia's southern Murray-Darling Basin. Irrigated agriculture uh, is uh, really the most fundamental uh, use of water uh, globally. It's about two-thirds of uh, all water use. And the Murray-Darling Basin comprises about 40% of Australian agriculture. This is surface water. Uh, and uh, the irrigated farms in this basin are the primary users of water uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, uh, this is a regulated river system, so the environmental regulation will interact with the distribution of permanent property rights to generate initial allocations of water in each year, and then farms will be continuously trading water throughout the growing season, subject to the evolving constraints on the network. And so uh, with uh, this uh, data uh, and uh, the empirical approach, I'm able to answer uh, three uh, empirical uh, questions and, and find sort of three main results. So the first question is, what is the value of the water market? This is in comparison between pre and post trade farm profits. And there I find that water on average flows from low to high marginal productivity farms and increases output by between four to six percent. Second, I can ask how uh, the water variability that's comparable to the kind of water variability we expect climate change to intensify. Uh, interacts with the value of the market. And there the finding is that uh, most of the gains are during uh, water scarce periods and in water scarce parts of the basin. And that makes these gains in particular highly convex in water scarcity. And finally, uh, the economic channels for adaptation are economically meaningful in the sense that a, a benchmark model uh, that uh, allows labor and materials to adjust um, uh, avoids overstating the gains from trade by about one third and a longer run infinite horizon model that allows land use decisions to adapt uh, uh, ha has about one fifth of the value of water trading arriving from uh, the uh, perennial and forward looking crop choices, which are uh, investments that make more sense in a world of more predictable water access under the market. Uh, so this uh, paper's primary contribution uh, in the context of uh, environmental economics is to demonstrate that water markets can create a considerable value. And this is in contrast to um, a, a series of papers which have, um, in the last four or five years, looked at uh, limited gains from trade uh, in, in other settings, such as Chile and the Western United States. It's also substantiating conjectures that go back to the 60s and 70s that use simulations in economic theory to suggest that these gains uh, may be potentially uh, high. Uh, in addition, um, by proposing that a water market can be an institutional adaptation to climate change, uh, these results are building on other work which have shown how markets can uh, change our view of the damages of climate change and expand our sense of the portfolio of potential adaptation strategies. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, the work is also contributing to literature more broadly in economics about factor misallocation, and there I'm drawing on uh, new techniques that have used the allocation of factors across firms and how those firms make their decisions on inputs uh, in order to learn something about uh, their production technology and infer some of the efficiency properties of the allocation under a relatively limited amount of assumptions about market structure or regulation. 
All right, so uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, how water trading works in the Murray Darling Basin and why it's such an interesting market before I talk about the model that I use to learn about the value of trading, uh, how I estimate that model in a way that's consistent with the theory and its implications uh, for the value of water uh, trading in a, in a changing climate. All right. So uh, I'm focusing uh, in particular uh, on these irrigated farms in Australia's Southern Murray-Darling Basin. So the Murray-Darling uh, is about uh, 400 square kilometers. That makes it approximately the size of California. It's a connected river network in the sense that the dark blue line in the center of the graph uh, is the River Murray, and that flows east to west and forms the legal boundary between the states of New South Wales to the north and then the state of Victoria to the south. And then the water flows from there into South Australia. And so the orange uh, dots are large scale dams, which are manipulated by government engineers who can predict and manage and monitor these river flows. And the basin itself is inhabited primarily by these irrigated farms. And so uh, these farms are uh, subject to an evolving system of environmental regulations uh, that determine the amount of water that is made available at the beginning of each year. Uh, and these uh, annual caps that are determined uh, in each region based on interstate water sharing agreements and in each year based on the overall river inflows into the dams uh, are then allocated to farms who can uh, then uh, trade those uh, rights uh, with one another. Uh, and uh, this market is um, overseen by the regulator in the sense that the regulator maintains an online ledger, but it's otherwise uh, quite decentralized. And any two farms can trade uh, provided that they are connected uh, at a given moment in time uh, in the precise sense of being connected uh, on the river graph. And so, uh, for example, uh, if you were a farmer in uh, Kaliambuli in the Murrumbidgee and you were interested in buying water from someone in New South Wales, Murray, then you would need a third party in the Murrumbidgee to back that trade because the net flow out of the Murrumbidgee cannot be negative. Uh, and that's because uh, the, the Murrumbidgee is a tributary. It flows into the River Murray, and you wouldn't move water upstream uh, under the current infrastructure because water is simply too heavy. Alternatively, uh, if you were a farm in sort of South Australia and you had a friend in, uh, say, uh, Victoria Murray, who you were interested in buying water from, and that water would need to flow through the Barmut Choke, which is the narrowest point in the river. Only about 750 megaliters of water can go through the Barma Choke in a given day before the water starts to flow over the banks and it no longer be uh, used. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, if there's more than 750 megaliters going through that choke point, uh, then all trades uh, above and below are, are going to be barred for that day. So these are the kinds of conditions which depend on weekly environmental fluctuations. So the sense in which it's, it's very hard to uh, think about just running simulations where you uh, take the value of various agricultural producers and then ask uh, how you could reallocate water. Um, but it's also uh, partly what makes this institution so exciting because water can be moved in response to these rapid conditions uh, and uh, create value across different users. So uh, the central uh, economic feature of this problem is the decision that the farms make. And so as a consequence, it's central to have data on how farms make input decisions. And as I describe in the paper, uh, this is immensely detailed data that contains uh, a wide set of decisions that farms are making, and in particular, their property rights uh, for water and trade. Uh, one uh, additional feature of water, of course, is the free water that comes from the sky. And so I, I have data from the Bureau of Meteorology that tracks rainfall for each of these farms. And in addition, uh, I have data that's administrative from uh, the regulatory agency that manages this market, as well as some state government records that allows me to keep track of uh, the water property rights, in particular their endowments. So uh, with these various data sources, uh, it becomes possible to estimate the value of water trading. And so to do that, I build a model of irrigated agricultural production. So at a high level, right, the way this model works is uh, perhaps best expressed in this sort of simple example. So uh, over the timing uh, of the agricultural calendar, the regulators have these diversion formulas, which I've denoted here by W bar R and W bar R prime. And these are the volumes of water which are allocated uh, to the users in the river basin. And then uh, 
each farm, so here I1, I2, I3, uh, are receiving water in proportion to the overall endowment and then their personal property right. And then they can trade these allocations amongst one another. In this example, you see that farm I3, he's trading both to his uh, neighbor I2, who's in his own uh, basin, and then his uh, distant uh, friend I1, and I1, she is uh, located in the uh, region R. So these post-trade irrigation volumes are then used for agricultural production. Uh, here we have these profit functions, pi, you can see they're indexed by the farm. And in the more general model, they'll also be indexed by the year. And that's because they depend not just on the volume of water the farm is using, but the whole range of experience and skills that the farmers have, the choices they've made over how to allocate land across crops, the other inputs they're using, the prices that they face, uh, the rainfall that they have, and uh, the various conditions which um, it create uh, differential values of water across users. So uh, this is the broad framework of the model, and uh, the approach to value water trading is to first estimate input-output relationships uh, to get at something economically meaningful that we can use to measure pi. And then second, uh, because I observe water rights linked to trades, I can then value the reallocation that occurred in the market and construct an estimate for the gains from trade that were realized under the actual market conditions. All right. So uh, the bulk of the work of the paper to estimate these uh, production uh, functions uh, and the payoffs to water across different farms depends on a model of agricultural production. So farms are indexed by I, uh, and they produce a variety of crop types, which I denote by C. And so uh, these can include things like wheat, rice, and cotton. Uh, annual dryland crops uh, include um, also crops like wheat and cotton, but do not use irrigation technology. Uh, pasture is heavily irrigated and also relies on uh, dairy cows and uh, perennial crops in, in, involve fruits such as orchards uh, or that are grown on, on things like orchards or, or vineyards. And so the specific model of production here, QICT is output, production function F sub C depends on a few key observed inputs. So irrigation, WICT is the most important. Land, of course, is important as well and also observed at the crop uh, farm your level. The rainwater uh, is the volume of water that is incident to that land. Um, and then labor and materials are some of these other economic inputs, which are uh, quite important to account for as well. Uh, the final component of this uh, crop a specific production function is an unobserved component, omega ICT. And this uh, is something which uh, the farmer understands and knows. It captures a composite of the variety of conditions that they face in that year, as well as their skill and expertise in growing the specific things that they have chosen. And this unobserved productivity is then combined uh, to generate uh, the output that they uh, are able to produce. And uh, there's uh, not a, a very strong restriction on the extent to which this productivity is generated, and that is precisely what allows a flexible model that uh, can capture some of the various reasons why farms might produce. Uh, at the same time, as you can see in this equation, it's uh, additively separable in log output, and this is uh, an assumption that uh, rules out the possibility, for example, of differential irrigation efficiency at the crop type level uh, for farms. The decisions that farms make will occur according to the agricultural calendar, and I'll also assume that farms choose labor and materials in order to maximize their profits, and that they're not influencing crop prices or wages through their output decisions or their hiring decisions, which reflects partly the fact that Australia uh, has many farms and also because Australia uh, exports about two-thirds of its agricultural commodities abroad. There are not similar restrictions on this irrigation, WICT, and that's a crucial part of the uh, framework that I discuss more in the paper. And this is exactly uh, what makes the estimates that I construct agnostic to the specific kind of market structure. And by not assuming that the water market or that the allocation under the water market happens to be efficient or a consequence of revealed preference, I'm not um, uh, sort of constructing the hypothesis that we're interested in testing, which is whether these markets do deliver uh, value. Okay, so uh, with the estimated production functions, it's then possible to construct estimates of this value uh, of the market. And there um, we would do that um, by uh, first constructing a causal 
uh, relationships between agricultural production uh, and the water input that is being used. And the big challenge to identifying this causal relationship is that because farms know their types of productivities, then farms who are sort of on average more productive might be using more water, uh, but that would create an upward bias in the relationship between water and output that we would uh, like to resolve. And so this is a problem that goes back all the way uh, to 1944. There's a econometric paper that was written during World War II by Jacob Marshak and William Andrews. Um, I'm using uh, modern methods in the estimation of production functions from industrial organization to learn something about the farm's productivity from the decisions that they make on auxiliary variables. And I'm also constructing a new instrument that uses how water is allocated across farms under these property rights regimes to uh, isolate a form of uh, quasi-experimental variation in water access. Uh, and that uh, final assumption is motivated by the mechanical nature of these uh, diversion formulas. But in particular, uh, it will rule out uh, omitted environmental variables that are correlated with both annual productivity innovations and diversion formulas, as well as uh, potentially endogenous regulatory responses to productivity innovations. And the first uh, is uh, much less concerning given that I observe uh, farm level rainfall and I can control for basin and year fixed effects because the variation happens uh, with, within a basin over years uh, in terms of the water availability through property rights. And the final concern about endogenous regulatory responses is also uh, less of uh, an issue for me because uh, the, the law that is written, the Water Act of 2007, uh, rules out uh, these kinds of discretionary policies and um, requires that agencies use these uh, diversion formulas that are specified uh, ex ante. And this is also consistent with my conversations with river operators in the Murray Darling. So uh, given a causal interpretation of the estimates of how one would take water and produce something in where, uh, one specific location in the, in the river basin, we can uh, simply ask what was the value of realized trading by contrasting the payoffs from the water allocation under the market, WIT, and the water allocation prior to trade, uh, WIT superscript A. And there, uh, I find uh, the primary estimate, uh, the first main result of the paper is a 6.2% increase in agricultural output over this nine year period. Uh, and that's something that's quite significant, I argue, from a climate change perspective. And that is because if you were to ask by how much would you need to reduce water across all farms in the basin before output fell to the level that it would have been prior to trade, uh, the answer to that question is about 11.8% of water resources. And that uniform decline in water resources is comparable to that which is being predicted by the short run climate models that the Murray Darling Basin uses for its planning, uh, which uh, generate predictions of between nine and 13% uh, surface water uh, in the average year and scenarios that are uh, more extreme in the tails. The second main result here uh, asks uh, how the value of the water market changes when water scarcity changes. And so there's a particularly simple way to study that question, which is to take farms and stratify them by the relative water scarcity that they've experienced and ask what was the gains from water trading for those specific farms. And this is uh, one exhibit of that relationship. So in the lowest quartile, we have farms who are in the bottom quartile of water availability for their region in that specific year. And you can see the gains from trade are about 10 and a half percent. Whereas uh, as you move forward uh, into the second, third and, and most abundant water quartiles, the gains from trade fall um, uh, but to only about three and a half percent. And this is the sense in which uh, the value of the market is concentrated in those places experiencing considerable relative water scarcity, which is uh, why we would think these gains from trade might increase in a world of climate change. So those are the two main empirical results. Um, I want to uh, simply close by saying that I uh, just started at UCLA this summer. And so for those of the audience who are in the UCLA community, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is just rayfi at uh, ucla.edu, and I would love to continue this conversation uh, in person. I thought this conference was gonna be in person, but at this point, it's cliche to make these kinds of remarks. Thank you. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Will, and congratulations for starting at UCLA this summer. Um, I don't see any questions for you just yet. It's a very shy group so far. Um, 
I have a bigger bigger picture question for you that I could ask now or I could hold until the end. But, uh, maybe something you'd like to think about. But, uh, yeah. You, you mentioned you, now? you mentioned earlier during the literature review that uh, the previous findings have found that you know water market there have been limiting limited gains from water markets in places like Chile. And so I was curious as to maybe what sort of factors are driving your results versus their results. What are some of the some of the differences that may drive the results? Absolutely. So I mean, I think there are two differences between my work and and these other papers, and they have different implications. So the first difference is that the Australian market is a very advanced river market, and the system has been functioning since the early '90s, and they have done a terrific job in getting to the place that they are now. Even starting in 2007, which is when my data begins, uh, they'd already been trading for about 15 years. And that kind of institutional experience uh, is, is crucial to understand the success of this experiment. So I view these results as a proof of concept, demonstrating that advanced mechanisms can function effectively. Um, and that, I think, is an important existence result that was absent from the empirical literature. Uh, the second uh, reason why my results differ um, is, is just a question of how the, the, the approach that I, that I use, right? So there are kind of two ways uh, that people have used. Uh, that have, uh, there's uh, really two main ways to value water markets that have been used in the past. The first is to say, all right, uh, we have uh, agricultural production functions, and we have a sense of yields and where the value of water might be in different places. And so what would happen if we simulated an allocation where everyone used the first best level of water, maybe subject to a couple of constraints, right? And that's an easy simulation to do. That's something that's been done since the 60s and 70s. Typically, those studies find tremendous gains from trade, like 50, 60, 70 percent. They find a huge amount of money that is being left on the ground because farmers aren't working together to trade water in a network, right? And those results are important, but they're also really hard to interpret because they're so fragile and dependent on the model of uh, river trade, uh, which is typically sort of swept under the rug. The second uh, way of looking at uh, water markets is, uh, in particular, the approach that's taken by a lot of these papers I referenced, which have small uh, gains from trade, are they just sort of ask, they look at the trading data. And they say, well, like there aren't a lot of trades, and so it must be really costly to trade. And they end up finding estimates that are very low in trading. So my work is is taking these two uh, approaches, right? So I'm I'm using agricultural production data, like these first simulation based approaches, but I'm not running simulations. And then I'm taking the trade data uh, that is possible because we have this experiment of this institution that's being running. Uh, and has water trading property rights, and I'm combining them in a way that allows me to learn something about the water market, um, but but avoid some of the pitfalls of these two prior approaches. Uh, I think that's that's the best answer. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Will. Um, I think we just got a question. Uh, yeah, Pierre asks a question about the. Uh, allocation of factors across crops. Um, and yeah, Pierre, uh, the uh, approach that I use, right? Um, so I, I see water that's allocated across crops. I see land, and that's also allocated specifically to the crops. Typically a farm, uh, as in my data, will only report kind of the number of labor hours that they use for the whole agricultural operation. Uh, and the way that I uh, infer how much labor and how much materials are allocated uh, across each crop for farms that are producing more than one crop is by uh, leveraging uh, the uh, optimization conditions that the farms would be using. So uh, you sort of allocate labor across your different crops in proportion to uh, uh, what essentially turns out to be a, 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 a revenue um, a revenue share that's weighted by the uh, crop specific elasticity. Okay, great, thank you, Will. I think uh, we'll move on to our final presentation and then we'll come back with uh, hopefully more questions at the very end. Um, last but not least, uh, Dr. Gesso will be talking to us about groundwater pricing. <laughs>
Okay, hi everyone. Um, I just wanna make sure you can hear me. I'm going to assume it's a yes, unless I hear from the moderators otherwise. Um, yes, great, okay. So today what I'm gonna do is I am going to talk about the long run industry impacts of pricing externalities. And the context in which I'm gonna look at this question is groundwater and agricultural land use in California. And in my mind, this relates to climate adaptation along kind of two fronts. The first is that we're gonna to start to think about using prices as a tool by which to um, manage groundwater. And the second is we can kind of provide a bit of a preview into the impacts of groundwater scarcity on agricultural land use in the longer run. So groundwater typically describes this classic common pool. Oh, I should mention this is joint work with Michael Henneman and Ellen Bruno. So groundwater describes this classic common pool resource, right? We typically think that it's rival. If I consume a unit, you can't, but it's non-excludable. So groundwater is often unregulated and property rights are poorly defined, right? And an implication of this kind of non-excludability is that extractors or groundwater pumpers don't internalize all their costs of their behavior. And I'm thinking in particular about three costs. That is when I extract a unit of groundwater, it increases the extraction costs, not only for myself, but for all my neighbors. Now they have to pump up, they have to kind of, um, the depth from the aquifer to the water table or to the ground, the depth from the aquifer to the ground, has increased, so it costs them more to pump up a unit of water. Second, if I pump a unit of water today, that unit of groundwater is not available for future generations. The third externality I think about as well is that if I pump a unit of water today, the contaminants in the remaining groundwater stock, think about salinity or arsenic or nitrates, might increase. The economist's prescription to these externalities is simply to price the externality such that it's internalized. However, groundwater is typically not priced. Groundwater is also kind of agricultural groundwater, I should say, is typically not priced, nor is it metered. So I want to give you kind of a quick kind of 10,000 foot view of groundwater. So if we think about groundwater globally, about 30% of the largest groundwater supplies are under stress, right? Declining water tables, as I previously mentioned, increase the cost to extract a unit of groundwater, so it increases agricultural production costs. Um, Overextracted aquifers may also degrade the quality of existing water supplies, kind of the water that remains in the aquifer. And kind of overextraction also makes uncertain the long run viability of groundwater irrigation. Groundwater kind of is really important in the California context. So in an average year in California, about 40% of our water supply comes from groundwater. But during droughts, kind of um, groundwater can make up up to about 80% of the water supply. Kind of US-wide, groundwater accounts for about 27% of the supply. So groundwater in the context of California provides this kind of essential kind of opportunity to buffer against the costs of drought. That is when we see these big curtailments in surface water supplies to agriculture, as is occurring right now, what often happens is agricultural users pump more and more groundwater to kind of buffer against or mitigate the cost from those reductions in surface water supplies. And the last thing I wanna note is that climate change is also gonna fundamentally alter water supplies in California. And this is gonna come about through a number of channels. A first channel I like to think about is one in which the total quantity of precipitation doesn't change. Simply, we observe warming temperatures, right? The kind of what happens with warming temperatures is it's gonna change the medium of precipitation. We're gonna have more rain and less snow. So you're gonna kind of think about this sometimes maybe as more water in those open reservoirs, less um, in that snowpack. We're also, because there's kind of more in those reservoirs, you can imagine that more water is gonna be kind of sucked up using evaporation. We're also gonna kind of have thirstier ground, right? Kind of soil moisture is going to be drier, so crops are going to need more water. So we can imagine warming temperatures um, are going to kind of alter water supplies. We're also going to have more frequent and extreme droughts. Kind of we're going to see kind of more instances in which we have these kind of surface water curtailments. Um, and lastly, with sea level rise, and kind of Valerie talked about this earlier, 
we're going to have saltwater intrusion. So you can imagine some of these aquifers that abut the Pacific coast, we can maybe see kind of saltwater intrusion into the existing aquifer. So kind of we know that groundwater is this important resource. However, kind of historically in the US and California, it hasn't been regulated. And one kind of the main pushbacks has been perceived industry cost. And so in our work, what we want to do is we want to kind of start to think about what are some of the agricultural impacts of pricing groundwater. And so what we're going to do is we're going to estimate both the short run and long run effect of groundwater pricing. So volumetric groundwater pricing for agriculture on agricultural water use, which we think about as input use, on irrigated acreage. That is kind of how much of agricultural land is irrigated for crops in a given year. We're gonna look at the impact of agricultural groundwater pricing on land fallowing. That is, this is agricultural land that you don't irrigate in a given year. We're gonna look at the impact on crop switching. And we're also going to look at the impact on firm exit. That is, you convert your agricultural land to non-agricultural land, or you simply move it out of crop production. The way that we're going to do this, or this, excuse me, the setting in which we're going to do this is we're going to do this in an irrigation district that charges volumetric pricing for agricultural groundwater. And this district also meters its water. So we're going to use data on quarterly groundwater extraction from 900 wells. This utility also collects annual spatial land use data kind of at the field level every year. The research design that we're going to take advantage of is we're going to take advantage of a shift from a single volumetric price for all users to two geographically distinct prices. Now, it's a really simple question that we're asking in this paper, right? What is the short and long run effect of agricultural groundwater pricing on agricultural water use and land use? Really simple question. But kind of quantifying this has been challenging. And why it's been challenging is particularly kind of trying to kind of needle in or zoom in on this long run margin of response. So agricultural land use decisions aren't these short run decisions. They're typically these longer run decisions where kind of the time between planting a crop and harvesting a crop can take from somewhere between six months to up to 10 years. If I'd given this talk five years ago, I would have said, we don't know very much about the impact of volumetric pricing on agricultural water use and land use. However, that's no longer the case. Recently, there's been kind of a wave of papers that look at how water use responds to volumetric water pricing in the short run, right? And kind of in general, these studies deploy a panel data approach that uses monthly or yearly variation in pricing. However, what these studies are not well suited to do or designed to do is to capture these longer run responses, such as agricultural land use. So what we're going to do in our papers, we're going to deploy a fundamentally different approach. And what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of this one time in permanent price split. And we're going to look at the impact of this one time in permanent price split on land use one year following the price split, two years following the price split, three years following the price split, and so forth. So why is this question important? Well, we think it's important for a few reasons. The first is that in practice, we just have really little experience with groundwater pricing. And so we're gonna provide kind of an on the ground evaluation of groundwater pricing to address groundwater externalities. The second kind of policy relevant aspect of our work is we think we're gonna be able to weigh in on discussions about how to regulate groundwater in California. So recently, California passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And what this act does, among other things, is it requires groundwater basins in California to achieve stable groundwater levels by 2040. Now, this rule is kind of vague about what it means by sustainability or stable. It also provides these different groundwater agencies a lot of flexibility in the instruments that they're going to use to achieve compliance. However, to date, if you pour through these different plans, you don't see a whole lot of demand side approaches, right? You see even fewer that lean on prices. And so there's really kind of little familiarity with, but lots of resistance to prices. And so we think our work can weigh in on the use of prices as a tool by which to manage groundwater under incoming California regulations. 
And lastly, we view our work as contributing to discussions on climate change adaptation. Right? And, we, and we see this kind of in a few ways. Um, the main one is that groundwater provides this really important resource by which to kind of mitigate the costs of surface water shocks or drought. And we think crisis may be a tool by which to jointly manage groundwater and surface water. Prices are also being used as a tool kind of to construct alternative water sources by which to buffer against the costs of surface water shock. So we view our work as also kind of contributing to kind of um, policy discussions on climate change adaptation strategies. So into our setting. So we're gonna look at agricultural groundwater pricing in the Pajaro Valley of California. This is shown in this yellow circle. It's this productive agricultural region on California's central coast. It's sandwiched between Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And about 97% of the water supply in this area comes from groundwater. So you're, there's not really kind of this outside surface water option that's available in most other districts. Now the Pajaro Valley is unique in that it charges a volumetric price for agricultural groundwater. And the reason they did this was to address increased salinity from saltwater intrusion. So what happened over time was that groundwater extraction led to a declining water table, such that parts of the water district started to fall below sea level. So that is the reason why the, um, the Water Management Agency introduced volumetric groundwater pricing to kind of slow down groundwater extraction but also to partly fund alternative water supplies in the form of recycled water supplies. However, there was only a limited quantity of recycled water available. So what the water district did was it established two water zones. So this map here, I have again, the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency. That's kind of in blue. Every black dot is a geocoded groundwater well. The purple shaded area is the area inside the delivered water zone, while the non-shaded area is the area outside the delivered water zone. Only farms inside the delivered water zone get access to water. Excuse me, access to recycled water. So in 1994, the water district introduced volumetric pricing and all agricultural users pay the same rate. So in this figure below, uh, what we have is we have on the x-axis kind of time, on the y-axis we have groundwater price. And we're, so we're gonna kind of look at how it changes over time. So up until 2010, everyone's paying the same price. Then in 2010, we see this price split. And there's about a 21% increase in prices inside the zone relative to those outside the zone where there's kind of this difference in prices holds for the first kind of six years following the price split. So why did this occur? Well, it all comes down to Proposition 218. So in California, we have this proposition and what it kind of requires is it requires that local governments must get taxpayer approval for property related fees and that the taxes charged, i.e. in our case, the water price, must reflect the proportionate service received. So Griffith kind of saw this and he sued the water district on the grounds that it violated Prop 218, right? The reason being that while everyone paid one price, only those inside the delivered water zone benefited from recycled water deliveries. So Griffith wins and we see this price split with those inside the zone facing kind of a permanent kind of 21% increase in price relative to those outside the zone. So the data we're going to use to look at the impact of this price split on land and water use is comprised of quarterly groundwater extraction data from each of these geocoded wells in the Pajaro Valley, where each of these black dots, again, demarks a well. What I plot out here is, again, we're plotting out mean well level extraction over time by whether or not you're located inside or outside the zone. So the outside is in green and inside is in orange. And what you can do if you squint, oh, I should say also this vertical line denotes when the price split occurred. So if you squint, what you might be able to see is that users inside the zone 
reduce groundwater use relative to those outside the zone following this price split. The second data set we're going to lean on is we're going to use annual land use data. And so what the agency does is they go every year and they survey the land and they note what is grown on every single field. So how are we going to use this data? Well, our kind of research setup is going to be this different different. So we're going to have these two farm types. Farms are located either inside the zone I or outside the zone O. And we're going to have these two time periods. You either kind of, we have period before the price change. So this is pre-October 2010, when all farmers pay the same price. And post-October 2010, when we have this price split. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the change in water use post and pre-price split for those inside the zone relative to that change for those outside the zone. Um, uh oh, I think I might have just, there we go. Um, I'm going to skip over the slide, but this is just to provide kind of indirect evidence in support of our parallel trends assumption. And I want to talk about kind of estimation. So how are we going to operationalize our framework? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to regress extraction or acreage for farm I of zone R in time T on farm and or year fixed effects the interaction of whether or not you fall inside or outside the zone with whether or not it's pre or post this price split. And depending on the specification, we're going to kind of control for a number of region time varying observables that might confound estimation. And so what are we gonna find? So the first thing I wanna show you is I wanna show you the effect of this price split on average water use. So this is the result from kind of the simple kind of dip and dip framework. And what we find is there's about a 37 to 41 acre foot reduction in annual groundwater extraction on average from the introduction of this price split from this kind of 21% price increase. This is on average. The next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at how this price split impacts water use over time. So I want you to focus on 2011. That is the first year following this price split. 2012 is the second year following this price split. 2013 is the third year following this price split and so forth. And so kind of the first thing that popped out to Ellen and I is that the fact kind of that the reduction in water use in response to this price increase increases over time, right? So this was kind of our first kind of cautionary lesson that we saw in leaning kind of too much on these short run estimates. And what we find is that if we compare kind of the first year of this price change to 2020, what we see is that the reduction in water use grows from 17 to 53 acre foot, acre feet per year. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna look at the effects, this is really what we're after, of this price split on agricultural land use. You can also think about this as maybe the effect of water scarcity on agricultural land use. And so what we find is kind of this first green line or kind of this first orange dot, it's not really a dot, shows us the effect of this price split on the quantity or acres of agricultural land in the first year following the price split. This second or 2012 kind of the um, Information corresponding to 2012 shows us the effect of this price split in the second, the effect of the price split on agricultural land use in the second year following the price split and so forth. So what we find here is that it takes time to retire agricultural land. We see this contraction in agricultural land where farmers are moving their agricultural land out of agriculture. Maybe they're moving it to kind of urban use or just kind of wild land but they're retiring or contracting the quantity of acreage used for agricultural purposes. However, again, it takes time to retire agricultural land and a short run of analysis would have failed to detect this response. So we see this about this 18% contraction on average in agricultural land in response to this price increase. The next thing we were wondering is, well, what type of agricultural land is retired? And so here, what we're plotting out is we're plotting out on the y-axis 
fallowed land. So if you're kind of newer to agriculture, as I was, what I learned is that you have agricultural land, and this land is comprised of kind of two general categories, either irrigated land, on which you're kind of irrigating your crops, or fallowed land, on which you're not growing crops in a given year. However, the sum of fallowed land plus irrigated land is your total eligible agricultural land. So what do we find? Well, what we find is that this price split leads to, or this price increase leads to kind of this contraction in agriculture or this exit out of ag, but by a very particular type of land, and that is fallowed land. So farmers, what they're doing is they're taking their fallowed land and they're converting it out of agricultural land. But again, we don't detect this until two years after the price split. Interestingly, we start to find though, beginning in 2016, that there's this kind of slight increase in fallowed land. And we were also wondering what was going on. So we wanted to look at irrigated acreage. So on our y-axis now, what we have is irrigated land. This is the quantity of acres on a given farm that is irrigated in a given year. So what we see is that in comparison to fallowed land or agricultural land, Irrigated land, especially at first, is relatively insensitive to this price increase. We don't see farmers really reducing kind of the quantity of irrigated acreage in kind of the first few years of this price split. Over time, however, right, if I look at kind of 2016, 17, 18, we start to see this reduction in irrigated acreage. Interestingly, if we pair this with a fallowed acreage result, what we see is we see this reduction in irrigated acreage corresponds with this commensurate increase in fallowed acreage. And what we think is going on is farmers kind of after they retire their fallowed land are starting now to toggle between irrigated and fallowed land. So they're kind of temporarily not growing crops on agricultural land. Our kind of last result is what happens to crop switching in response to this price split or price increase. And what we see as we anticipated is we start to see, I should say, um, we plot in purple here, the um, other agriculture, which we kind of categorize as lower value crops. So acreage and lower value crops as compared to acreage in vegetables and strawberries, which we classify as our higher value crops. And what we see is that in response to this price split, there is kind of crop switching or farmers are reducing or moving out of agriculture a very specific type of crop. That is, we see a reduction in the acreage devoted to lower value crops, whereas we don't really see a change in the quantity of land devoted to vegetables or strawberries. So what do we take from this? Well, what we take from this is that a permanent and large price increase is going to impact agriculture in California. We're going to see a reduction in water use. We're also going to see this conversion of temporarily fallowed land out of agriculture. So we're going to see a contraction in agricultural acreage. We're also going to see a reduction in irrigated acreage, most likely of these lower value crops. We think this result also kind of provides a preview into the agricultural land impacts of water scarcity. The second thing we think we've really learned is that some of these margins of adjustments don't occur until the longer run. Right, so we really need to bring kind of a long run kind of empirical lens to these questions, right? We see when we compare, when we compare one year after the price split to four years after the price split, a doubling of a reduction in input use or a doubling of the reduction in water use. And we fail to detect any changes in agricultural acreage if we constrain our analysis to one year following the price split. So we think the second lesson learned from our study is just kind of the importance of kind of thinking about like the longer run response of groundwater pricing and water scarcity. Now, the last thing I just want to note is there's a lot of caveats in our analysis, right? Our price change is only occurring in one agricultural district. So, um, you know, leakage could be occurring um, if we kind of had this kind of broader, there might be, the, um, or excuse me, leakage could be occurring, price effects could be occurring, and also our location is very specific and that surface water is not available. So kind of with all that said, um, please feel free to reach out. I know I blasted through that. Should you have um, any other questions, I threw out my email for you there. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Katrina. That was a fantastic presentation. Um,
And we have two questions. I don't know if you can see them. Um, the first one is by Kathleen Miller, or from Kathleen Miller. Uh, she asks, in the context of high interannual variability in precipitation and groundwater recharge uh, slash base flow discharge, how did that affect the desirability of interannual variability of groundwater pricing and or subsidies for managed aquifer recharge activities? Kathleen, that is a great, a really great question. Um, I guess like my, you know, my knee jerk response or answer is that I haven't even kind of thought about that. And the reason I haven't even thought about it is just that historically kind of we don't even, and it seems like you're quite familiar with the California context, like in California for agricultural groundwater, we rarely meter it. And in the few instances where we do meter it, we don't price it. And so I feel that I've just been like, kind of hunting around for um, locations where groundwater is metered or even there's a volumetric price that exists. So I haven't even gotten to like the next question or step of um, like the desirability of interannual variability in groundwater pricing and or subsidies. Cause I'm still in that kind of like nascent step of just trying to see um, or get kind of a dialogue going on groundwater pricing as a tool to manage um, a manage groundwater. I should say like the only other thing I want to say um, on your question, Kathleen, is it, again, in the California context, if you go over to the Coachella Valley, which is over by Palm Springs, what they actually do is they have groundwater pricing. And the reason they do it is exactly what, what you said is for um, aquifer recharge activities. So they go and they kind of artificially recharge the aquifer using, um, using groundwater prices. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing these seeing these questions. That's right. You have another question from Daniel Foster. He asks, early in the presentation, you mentioned pumping can cause contamination of groundwater. Is groundwater processed after extraction? Therein, would improvements in water treatment methodologies affect pricing or accessibility? Daniel, a really good question as well. So here again is what I understand about this. And this isn't necessarily the Pajaro Valley context, but is the Coachella Valley context is um, groundwater is processed for extraction when it's used for drinking water purposes. Often it's not treated when it's used for agricultural purposes. So we think about it as, um, as raw. Um, I guess another thing that I think about is different contaminants can be treated differently. So, you know, I, I, I and, and I'm using the, the example, the running example I have in my head is nitrates, where it's really hard to um, treat um, nitrates in the groundwater source. Um, so would improvements in water treatment and methodologies impact pricing or accessibility? So I guess your question is, if we could have a, a treatment methodology that just removed all the salinity from the groundwater resource, then we shouldn't worry about this. Um, and I think that's a fair point. You have another question from Louis, Louis Chua. Curious about why you decided to decompose fixed effects, i.e. year, county, would you consider watershed year fixed effects? Um, we, we do year, we do county, we do, or we do year, we do well, and then we do county year. Um, I want to say we only are using one watershed, but that is a good point and one that I will make note of, Lewis, and consider incorporating um, once I could kind of give a firm answer on, I, I want to say it's just one watershed because it's just one groundwater basin, but I, 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 I can't confirm that. What are the lower value crops? Would that be grains and the like? Ned, that again is a really, really good question. I wish I could answer it. I feel like on our team, I bring like the water perspective and I feel as if I'm the consumer of the agricultural perspective. And so I can't comment exactly on what the um, lower value crops are. We've just been like, that was just like one way we sliced them. I would say another way we're also trying to think about this, um, which I think would be really interesting to think about is how the price split impacts longer run crops like trees versus annual crops. Um, but I would have to let you know, Ned, I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, should I answer, keep answer, should I answer the next question? Is that okay, Ahmed? Uh, sure. Uh, so it's a, it's more, this, this last one is a comment oh. and I can, I can augment it with an actual question, but Colleen asks, what Colleen, uh, this is what she, Colleen says. Thank you so much, Katrina, for your work and sharing your knowledge. I don't have, really have a question, 
I'm just floored by the fact that groundwater is not metered or priced in California. That seems insane to me. While I'm skeptical about the effectiveness of capitalism slash market-based approaches to the capitalism slash market-based problem of climate change, it does seem like even beginning to value such an important resource like groundwater, or it, does, it does seem like an, an even beginning, it seems like a beginning, uh, a start to, to valuing an important resource like groundwater. Thank you for working on this. Um, I would augment this question by asking how are, how, how, um, how are, ground, how are prices for groundwater set? Okay, so I would want to say a few things. Uh, one, Colleen, thanks for the comment. I, and I, I think it's not all doom in the sense that one thing that's happened is that over time, groundwater has been so overextracted in California that I think this is one of the reasons we saw the passage of the 2014 Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Right. So in 2014, we have this kind of landmark regulation for groundwater in California, and it's requiring all these groundwater basins to achieve stable levels by 2040. And so what you see is like hundreds of these sustainability and it's this bottom up regulation. So they have the formation of each of these groundwater sustainability agencies. They have to come up with these groundwater plans by which they're going to achieve ground um, water level. So I guess what I should say, Colleen, is that you're right. It is insane that groundwater has not been metered or priced, um, given especially that agriculture accounts for 80% of water use in California. Um, but I will say the landscape is really changing. And so I think as an academic, it's a really fun time to be working on this, because if there's ever a time to start to think about the promise or the perils of market-based approaches to manage groundwater, kind of now's the time to be in that discussion. Um, and then Ahmed, yours was how are prices determined? Prices determined, or, or maybe even better, you know, what are some of the challenges to implementing prices in this sector? I think the, one of the main challenges is, is again, I mean, if you work on water in California, also in residential water, agricultural water, Prop 218, right? Um, it's just this idea that it's really hard to price water because you have to show that it's kind of proportionate to the benefit you receive. Right. So when we think about pricing structures that we use in California for maybe electricity, those can't be transferred necessarily to the water context because of kind of the, the institutional framework. Great. Um, I have an, actually I have another bigger picture, bigger picture question for you. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so I was actually pretty surprised to see that, you know, because of the price increases, the long run response was to exit ag. I was, uh, you know, another response could have been to adopt some sort of technology, maybe like drip irrigation to kind of offset the increases in price. Um, and so I guess my question for you is, what are some of the, the bigger picture implications of your findings? I mean, I, I think the big, a big picture implication of our finding, I think, is that agricultural land use will change with water scarcity. And, 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 and the way we're looking at that is through, in a way, is through water will likely change in our setting um, with water scarcity um, and in our, in our setting, water pricing. Um, and I think one thing that we learned is that that's hard to detect with kind of these short run estimates. I think we're going to see, again, a big picture thing is this kind of contraction of agriculture but with very specific type of land, right? This is like the land that on which you weren't, you weren't growing crops anyways. So I think kind of the, the you know, I, I think kind of one headline result is that, wow, um, the, the quantity of land for ag is gonna reduce, but the second kind of equally kind of important result is kind of what type of land is gonna be taken out of ag. And it's, and it's, and it's this fallow land. So, uh, so the, those would be my two takeaways, as well as just the importance of looking at the long run response. Fantastic. So we have one more question from uh, Kyle. Uh, how does social equity come into play in this conversation, especially for small farmers of color? Are groundwater price increases accounting for the ability for farmers to pay for these rising costs, or is it forcing small family farmers out of business? Kyle, this is a really, really good question, and I don't, I don't know the answer to it. I, I don't know. Um, I think, Kyle, how I've been thinking about, I think this is an interesting social equity um, point to bring up. How I have been thinking about social equity recently, though, in the groundwater setting is not so much like a farmer to farmer comparison, but is more a farmer to domestic well use comparison. So if you go to like the San Joaquin Valley in California, where most people use groundwater, what we see happening is that, you know, and it's right now, it's just kind of this like qualitative or, or even a correlational analysis is what you see happening is you see 
kind of this strong correlation between droughts and the drying up of these domestic wells, right? And so that's a social equity issue I'm thinking about is that kind of these, these um, lower income communities um, and um, kind of people of color, um, these domestic well users are the ones that are kind of suffering kind of disproportionately kind of in this correlational sense from um, the drying up of wells in response to um, droughts or kind of groundwater pumping. So I'm thinking about the interplay between domestic users and farmers, less so kind of across farmers, but that's a, that's a really, really, really important um, and interesting point. But I don't know, and I wonder if we could design, and, and, and one thing we, we should be thinking about is if we do design markets or market-based approaches, like how do we design those with an eye towards kind of their distributional implications as well? You have another question from uh, Carrie. If farmers are following land after price increases and also taking out fallow land out of agricultural use, is that resulting in a removing of productive land from the agricultural land base or is the fallow temporary? So I interpret fallowing as temporary. So I think about, and again, this is my nascent understanding of agriculture. You might have a much better understanding of this is I think about there's, you have your, your, your kind of the way we look at it is someone has their property. That's how we're empirically looking at it. And on their property boundaries, we know if land is used for agriculture or if it's not. So if it's not used for agriculture, it's permanently converted out. Um, within agricultural land, you could be doing two things. You could be either irrigating that land, so you're growing a crop on it in a given year, or you're fallowing it. So you're not you're not irrigating it on a given year. So um, I think when um, so I think when they're taking fallowed land out of agricultural use, they're retiring that land. I think when they're taking irrigated land and they're moving it to fallowing, that is just a temporary response. Um, so. Fallowing is temporary. Movement from fallowing to non-agricultural land is permanent. And the extent of the productivity of that land, I'm not quite sure. OK. Um, well, thank you, Katrina. This was obviously a fantastic presentation that sparked a lot of interest. Um, at this point, I think I'd like to invite all presenters to the stage um, so we can open up for a, a broader discussion. And if the audience members have questions for you know, the other presentations, feel free to type them into the Q&A. Um, Valerie, I'll start with. Uh, I have I have one question for you that I meant to ask you earlier, but uh, didn't didn't uh, didn't think to ask. Um, so it's, uh, I think maybe it's more appropriate to ask you now, anyway. Um, after you know hearing from Katrina and Will about some of the uh, more you know practical applications or you know interventions uh, to address uh, climate impacts, um, I would like to ask you like what are some what are some ways to that you know of that can constrain the the salinity expansion. I mean, what do you mean? It's it's so how do how do we reduce the impact? I mean, so that, I mean, one one aspect would be to sort of somehow control irrigation use in in the region during the dry season, um, because a lot of the salinity is coming from the depletion of of groundwater. Um, but with respect to other interventions, I'm not quite sure. It seems that what they're doing, what we could encourage, is sort of uh, adoption of saline tolerant varieties, so that we don't have a. There's not a lot of successful um, rice tolerant varieties, but what some households have been doing is sort of transitioning into the production of vegetables and things like that. So one could sort of conceive an idea of de developing a, a strong, a, a bigger market for those types of products. A lot of other farmers, I mean, I don't want to take the, I don't know how far you want me to go with this, but a lot of the other farmers have sort of diversified into shrimp and aquaculture project, production, but that displaces a lot of subsistence farmers. So it's not entirely clear what we do um, with the smallholder farmers. Hmm. Um, and Katrina, uh, and Will, you know. <clears throat> oh, I, I was wondering if I could make a comment. Please. Uh, just in, in response to your 
a really great question for Katrina uh, about how water prices are set. Uh, I think my sort of high level comment uh, is that's immensely important. Uh, and one way of setting water prices, as we know in economics, is to set quantities and then allow trade. Um, and of course, another way is to just set fees directly. Um, and I think there are a lot of interesting questions um, about which approach is, is preferable. I think one reason why specifying quantities and then allowing uh, trade has prevailed in places like Australia um, is, and, and in, in, in fact, the, the California law is also a, a volumetric specification um, with a variety of implementation strategies. But I think that's because we can see how much water is available and we can observe that and we have a sense of what happens when things go too far and when there's no more water left. Uh, and so I think as we think about how to design uh, these uh, strategies for dealing with water, um, asking the question that you articulated, which is where is this price coming from, is just essential. Because from a welfare standpoint, it's just not obvious what that price is, right? So Katrina's setting is really cool. You have two very different price paths but there's also a very different reason why those two price paths uh, are, are the way they are, because in one case, there is a clear externality for intrusion. In the other case, it's less obvious there's that externality. And so I think we have very limited understanding right now of how to construct these pricing uh, systems in any optimal way. In part, that's because the system's been so far away from a reasonable pricing system for a variety of political kind of reasons. In part, it's because there are a lot of measurement issues with what this happens to be the case. Um, but in any event, I just think that I, I really liked that emphasis because it's essential. Thank you, Will. That was an excellent answer. Uh, it's something I, you know, I deal with a lot in, in, in thinking about water prices for the residential sector, but the analog is, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a lot more challenging in the ag sector. Um, so Colleen has a question for all of you. Um, she asks, do the researchers have any plans to work with indigenous communities in California about their priorities for uh, water use and pricing? Living in dry part of Oregon, tribes are trying to maintain water in rivers for fish, which is antithetical to what ir irrigators are trying to do. Just wondering, that's a future interest for researchers. Thanks. I can answer that very clearly, no, because I don't work in California. <laughs> But I know that I know that it probably wasn't meant for me. It was my fault for you know. Advocate saying it was for everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can answer that um, just in the context of Australia, right? So Australia has a, a long legacy with uh, First Nations people, right? And there, there are more than forty First Nations um, uh, in the in the basin, the Murdoch Basin. Uh, and part of the Australian government's strategy uh, has been to uh, support the property rights for water uh, and activities uh, for uh, the cultural flows. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's always an ongoing uh, problem. Uh, and I think the one comment I will make is just there is this kind of um, interesting challenge with maintaining distributional outcomes uh, and allowing for water trading because the whole reason why water trading is uh, creating potentially a value is through redistribution. And so that means water will have to leave places where it's not being productive uh, to go elsewhere where it is productive uh, and how to manage that transition in a way that uh, is equitable for the communities involved is a really important challenge. So on one hand, in an idealized economic setting, you have uh, people who are engaging in voluntary transactions. And so I only sell my water as a community if the value I'm getting from that trade exceeds the value I could have from agricultural production. But in practice, the challenge there is you have many different interests who own water, and there are often spillovers. So uh, you as a farmer might enjoy living in a community because there are other people in that community who are doing the same thing. Um, and once some of them start leaving, it becomes a much less nice place to be a farmer and so communities can unravel and so there's been a lot of opposition to the free trade and property rights. Um, but I think just like in making that transition, um, we have to have to be very careful uh, to be attentive to the community, these community concerns, um, but I don't think those community concerns are typically 
uh, well, I, I think it depends on the specific setting. Um, but um, one thing I'm really glad about the emphasis of distributional effects in economics has just been the fact that it's nice to uh, think about these full distribution of outcomes because we have all this data. But a lot of the original focus in economics on efficiency was the idea that if you can improve welfare uh, on net, then there exist transfers that can compensate people uh, who are sort of worse off um, uh, all, uh, without doing those transfers, but then initiating those transfers. And so in the water context, people need to be uh, compensated for uh, those water property rights. And there are many settings where there, there does not exist compensation. Um, and you should ban trade. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's, that's my answer. Thank you, Will. Katrina, would you like to comment? Sure, I'll just say one little, um, I, you know, I, I want to kind of echo what Will said, which was, you know, in economics for a long time, we've been thinking, the last thing you said, which was like, we were thinking about how, how to make the pie as big as possible. And now we're thinking a lot more kind of in a pragmatic way, not just in a theoretical way about like how to split up that pie, right? It's just not making kind of the pie as big as, as possible, but also oh, how do we split it up? Um, I think, um, Colleen, to your question, I have been thinking about it just more like a discussion sense. And I've been thinking about it, and I'm sure you're thinking about it a lot in the context of this drought, right? It's really kind of hitting um, that area um, really, really hard. And so you have all these different kind of competing interests living in a world in which there are kind of scarcer supplies. And so it's kind of how do we um, allocate kind of these supplies in this kind of much scarcer um, world. And I think I think it's important to think about kind of all the users that rely on those um, supplies and kind of the value they attribute to it. And kind of there really is a value to environmental uses. We're not, and, and I think kind of we have a toolkit by which to kind of place kind of value on these non-market goods. Um, but it, but it's, it's hard to do. And I think kind of works going forward on on that. It's not necessarily what I'm working on, but I think kind of trying to think about kind of these the, the environmental kind of value of, of these uses is, is really important to kind of the discussion of how to allocate these scarce supplies. I don't know. In the context, I, I'm just going to chime in. In the con I usually, I've done some sort of, I've done water studies in, in Africa and just metering, the just figuring out how to collect and meter the water is tough enough in a very small irrigation system and then you know try, trying to politically you know use try to meter that at national scale and then trying to sort of you know implement some sort of pricing scheme seems like very very difficult so i mean i think the context that we're all working in are very different and the types of policies that you would promote are going to be very different because of the governance structures and politics. So I know we keep talking about indigenous communities, but you know, there's this whole other part of the world um, besides, you know, uh, the country, the United States and Australia. And so I think we have to be a little bit more um, creative and innovative in how we can get people to conserve. Yeah, and I want to ju yeah. jump in really last. I apologize. This is. Kind of minor but another aspect of colleen's question was about uh, maintaining water in the rivers for recreational uses such as fishing um and and how that is potentially competing with irrigators and i, I want to emphasize that in australia uh, they do not have a sort of water market to deal with that uh issue and in part that's because it's very difficult to coordinate fishermen to pay for water rights um and so they use a sort of quota system so there's an amount of water that goes for environmental purposes, and that's managed by the government. There are no prices there. Uh, and the prices are being used only to allocate water across farms, given that uh, division. And so that's just to say that we, we want a variety of hybrid approaches to solve those trade-offs. And some trade-offs are better sort of solved in sort of democratic uh, institutional ways, uh, rather than necessarily through market forces. Um, and I just, I, I just one, one last thought, just building on that is, um, Another part of what Colleen's question is, you know, how do we value certain uses of water that are not market-based, so non-market valuation? So you mentioned recreation, but there's also cultural uses of water that are um, that are pretty important that need to be uh, need to be valued. That can't we can't use necessarily economic tools to do that, um, or it's challenging to do that. 
but on that note, the uh, the staff is uh, Britta is reminding us that we have we are pretty much out of time. Um, so I think Britta, do we have time for one last question? Yeah, great, fantastic. We just got a question in the Q and A from Lewis. Does the panel think degradation of natural capital is worth incorporating as a form of externality to lower ag productivity, biodiversity, et cetera? Sure. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, natural capital is, is clearly valuable. Uh, I think it depends on the extent to which it's internal, internalized by the agent, right? So I think about farmers who are um, having greater extraction costs because they're drilling deeper into their own well and there are no spillovers, then maybe it's less of a concern. But you know, nat yeah, natural capital, there's no question. Um, and I think in the spirit of uh, the broader discussions about water and intertemporal sustainability, I think about um, accessible water resources as being a form of natural capital. And that's part of what makes it such a difficult problem because these dynamic optimization problems are very hard to solve, especially when things are stochastic uh, and payoffs are nonlinear. And um, we just don't really know, right? And how to, how to solve that capital management problem. But that uh, asset pricing or, or dynamic perspective can be very helpful to clarify. I mean, a lot of us, ev everyone on this panel is sort of data driven, but there's there have been a lot of attempts to do this with modeling, like computable general equilibrium models or agent-based models. Um, but I don't think any of us do that stuff on this panel. Yeah. Well, I'll just end by, by, by thanking you all. Valerie, Katrina, Will, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I learned a lot, they were very insightful and the panel clearly, the, the audience clearly was uh, pretty engaged. So thank you very much. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.